<laughs> it's Five Live Breakfast. An official review into the family justice system in England and Wales has rejected proposals to give fathers a legal right to share custody of their children after a separation or divorce. Former civil servant and businessman David Norgrove wrote the report. Good morning to you. Morning. I'm going to get the reaction from Ken Sanderson from the campaign group Families Need Fathers in a minute to your points. So how do you come to this conclusion? Well, we start from the point of view that this is not about the rights of parents. This should be about the welfare of children. And we are absolutely clear, of course, that that having a relationship with both parents is important to children in the great majority of cases um, uh, where it's safe for that to happen. The background here is that most people separate without going anywhere near a court. So over 90% of people uh, don't go to a court case. But for those who do, the last few percent who do go to a court case, the risk with having something like that put in legislation is that the children get put into the middle and they get torn, and the evidence, particularly from Australia, is that that damages children. But they are in the middle. Well, they are in the middle, but we don't want to make them a weapon in the, in the battle. So you want it, you don't want it in, to be statutory, and yet it is in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. It's, it's right that children should have a relationship with both parents where it's safe for that to happen. What we're saying, though, is that that shouldn't be put in legislation. And, in fact, the evidence is that judges... Um, don't show bias and that they do try to achieve that whenever they possibly can. By not putting it in legislation, are you not sending a very dangerous message that fathers are not as important? And that's... What kind of licence does that give the, the fickle Friday night fling or the, or, the, or, the, or the film star who has a short relationship and then a love child or whatever? Well, it's, 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 it's a green light for the, the feckless, isn't it? No, absolutely not. I mean, the, we, we've made all sorts of recommendations to try to help parents stay together and focus on their ch and focus on their children if they're separating, um, and we think it's very important that government and in every way we should be encouraging joint parental responsibility and involvement of both parents in their child's life. Well, make it legal. We just then. don't want to make a put us put this into statute. That the evidence from Australia, and in fact they very much regret having done this, is that it pushes judges into decisions that damage children and the damage is serious this isn't we're not talking trivial things here we're talking about serious damage to children and of course it only really helps or it's only really applied in those last few percent of cases where the conflict is really really serious right sometimes children better off with their fathers though aren't they they may be and courts in those cases do decide that S stay there i want to get a, a further comment from from you in a minute but let's get a reaction to what you have said from ken sanderson from the campaign group family needs families need fathers ken sanderson what do you think hi there nikki yes um families need fathers are a campaigning group for children so let me just make that clear first uh, what i'm going to say is for the best interests of children now unfortunately the family justice system is to a large extent based on principles that were founded in 1950 1960 they're very much out of date and those principles are that the man is the hunter-gatherer and the woman is a nurturer-carer. Uh, and that just clearly isn't the case anymore. I mean, recent Aviva research showed that in the last 10 years, the number of fathers taking a primary role in care for children had uh, increased by tenfold. So those principles that the family courts tend to work with are so out of date. Um, and you're absolutely right. This is a really, really important matter. And when we have really important matters in society, then the law tends to take a lead. Um, unfortunately, shared parenting is misunderstood by a lot of people. We're not campaigning so that little Johnny or little Gemma spends 50% of her time with Dad and 50% of her time with Mum. What we're talking about is a system where both parents matter and that both parents have equal moral authority, that both parents uh, are in a position that can uh, talk to their children about their education, about their friends, about what's going on at school, can go into school, can get information from the doctor, okay, from the okay. hospital. We hear exactly what you're saying. Let me p just put a final point then back to David Norgrove. The infer inference from this proposed legislation then is that mothers are more important. No, I mean, I, a lot of what Mr Sonnison's just said I absolutely agree with. 
all those things are important. Fathers are very important in children's lives. And there's, we want to work as, as want government and everyone to work to try to achieve that as much as possible. All we're against is that final step of putting it in legislation because the evidence from other countries is that that damages children. Thank you both very much indeed. Um, let's get your thoughts on this. Uh, <clears throat> interesting, the UN Convention. Ruth, what do you think? Well, I've only had time to skim read the report, but at first glance it is rather disappointing. Um, yet again, we have another layer of bureaucracy, uh, bureaucracy uh, proposed with the Family Justice Service. Um, the exclusion of uh, the lack of equality for both parents following separation is extremely disappointing. You sound like you work in this area, perhaps. Yes, I, I, uh, I volunteer for Wikibors. We're uh, the, the UK's largest divorce support forum, and we see many, many cases on our forums where fathers are denied access for, for no good reason, um, and they go through very, very lengthy court processes, um, which is extremely distressing, not just to themselves, but to the children who have been denied the right to a meaningful relationship with their father. Well, this report seems to reject all claims by fathers' rights groups, and we'll speak to Matt in just a minute, that the current system is biased. Is the current system biased? Um, there is this perception that it is, um, and I, my personal view would be, yes, it is. Um, when you don't have equality for parents, then, of course, the system's going to be biased. Ted. Thank you. From uh, 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 ne Nicky, let, let me just start off by saying that actually most dads who've been in this situation will find it very difficult to speak unemotionally about this because it's dealing with perhaps the most important relationship in their lives, which is that with their children. Mm -hmm. But I'm just so gladdened to hear Ruth saying what she's saying because by not giving fathers um, the, the, the right to, to residential rights assumed when a marriage goes down, all the system does is that one, it puts the children in the middle to be used as weapons, possession being nine-tenths of the law. Secondly, it, it really rewards malfeasant mums. And, and here's the kicker. What it also does is that it provides deadbeat dads with the, with the first opportunity to walk away from their relationships and their responsibilities to the children. A license for the feckless. Yep, absolutely. Beautifully put. But, Nikki, do you know, um, when I got divorced, I spent a fortune guaranteeing access uh, to my two children. I realized that actually I wouldn't be successful unless my career played second fiddle, my earning situation um, played second fiddle, and at the same time I was spending a lot of money. After three years, I sacked my lawyers and started representing myself, which is when I actually started getting results. So all of this is because, okay, for 90% of cases, people are very reasonable with each other, but for the 10% of cases, if you have a person who is intent on getting their own way without thinking about the welfare of the children, this law is a license for them to do absolutely anything that they like. Ruth, do you want to come back? Yes. Um, I, I don't disagree with the previous caller. Um, I mean... <laughs> There's a, a number of other points that I, I would like to make um, regarding the mediation. Mediation is, is great if both parents are willing to be open-minded and sit down and discuss, but when you have one parent who is dogmatic in their approach and refuses to, to discuss the issue um, in a reasonable manner, mediation won't work. In Scotland, for example, mediation is the preferred option, and a, a sheriff, which is like a district judge, will actually... Uh, um, uh, uh, I've forgotten the word now. It will it will refer them back to to, to mediation um, and adjourn the case until mediation ha has been uh, undertaken. Yeah. So the emphasis in Scotland certainly is on on communication and mediation. Um, but as I said, if if one parent is being dogmatic and unreasonable, mediation will not work. Um, the other point that I would like to make is is the so-called secret family courts. Um, there is no uh, moves there to open up the family courts. In Scotland, for example, there are no secret family courts. Family court hearings are heard in public, and there is media reporting, um, which does open up the system. <clears throat> Matt, Matt O'Connor, um, what about Mr Nogra's point that enshrining such rights in law would slow down the process and make, it, make them unnecessarily expensive? We've already heard from Ted there about the, the cost and stress and hassle of the lawyers involved. Um, Nikki, I'm, I'm, I, I'm almost lost for words. Um, I've been doing this for 10 years of my life. I've got uh, three young boys who I am uh, blessed with, and 
do see, and I'm very fortunate. I, I'm just, I just can't begin to describe how heartbroken everybody at Fathers for Justice is. Um, this morning, I've just bumped into David Norgrove uh, coming out of the studio, had a pleasant chat, and I just can't begin to well, fathom out how... Well, what did you say to him? What did he say to you? I'm sure, oh, well, it, I'm, sure it went, I'm sure it went beyond good morning, how are you, mate? Well, I was, we, always contrary to popular belief, we do always try and be yeah. quite polite. And I'm sure, yeah, yeah. I am house trained, you know, uh, um, so I'm, yeah. I'm not too bad. But the first thing I said to him, to be honest with you, Nicky, was at the heart of this whole issue is a lie. And the lie is this, we act in the child's best interests. And I said to him, I said, David, where is the evidence to support that claim? because you claim you act in the child's best interest. The courts claim they act in the child's best interest. The judges claim they act in the child's best interest. And he said, we have no evidence. And I said to him, I know you've got no evidence because nobody in family law, in the government or anybody, has bothered to keep any records on the outcomes for children. And the outcomes we can see in our country, we saw them this summer with the riots, we see it with the highest rate of young offending, in Western Europe, we can all see around us. We all know people touched by a family breakdown who have lost contact with their children or their grandchildren. And to write a report without evidence is a disgrace. I cannot begin to tell you how upset and disappointed we are about this whole report. Um, let, we're going to talk to um, somebody who is on the line now. I've just lost my... Karen Woodall. Sorry, Karen. Um, hi. Hi there, Karen. Um, director of the charity Centre for Separated Families. That's right. What do you think about this? Um, I think it's a missed opportunity. I think David Norgrove has made a big mistake. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that we are supporters of the presumption of shared care as it's been set out in arguments over recent years, but I think that it's absolutely essential that this country is given a message about the importance of fathers in their children's lives, and I think that the report itself is a real missed opportunity. Well, it's not necessarily going to be, you know, put on the statute books, and we read that there are some people within the cabinet who are very, very worried about mm. it. But uh, shared access and uh, equality of access and equality of care are two different things, aren't they, slightly? Well, we would prefer to talk about relationships with children. We don't use the word access. Access is a real problem. Um, people who have good strong relationships with their children before they separate are sometimes and um, well quite often reduced to the status of an access parent which is just problematic right from the start. Parents who uh, live together, they bring up their children together, their mum and dad, they interact with different roles. On separation currently in this country they are divided very very starkly into a good parent and a distant bad parent and I think that the word access is a real problem. I think that the uh, difference between children having relationships with um, parents after separation which are supported by um, government legislation which is supported by the right kinds of services and the situation that we've got now is very very problematic a lot of the services that we deliver a lot of the messages that government give actually divide parents further and actually act to put fathers at distance from their children which I think as your previous um, uh, caller has been explaining um, is probably uh, leading to scenes uh, like the riots that we excuse me that we had in the summer Mm -hmm. Can I just, if I may just say, um, I'm a black male, okay, and the specific impact of the way the law is right now actually obstructs black fathers who want to stay in touch and parent their children. It's interesting what, she, uh, what was said just now about the language. In all my letters, I refused to call it contact. I called it a parenting time. Mm -hmm. Do you see? Because by, you know, by, by, by using that sort of language, all it does is it somehow demonizes, diminishes the role, the importance, the value of the father in the whole process. And the last thing I, I'll say, if I may, is that for some reason, people are afraid, especially politicians, to come out and say when parents who are female are behaving badly. The court system protects outrageous behavior um, in the courts when it's presented by women. I so this is, this, is, this is institutional sexism? What a wonderful way to put it. 
you see, so, so, so these are some of the difficulties, and it is such a pity the man who wrote this report has not got a clue what he's talking about. He doesn't know the kind of misery he has consigned lots of children yet to be members of broken families to endure. But if you put his argument is if you make it statutory, that will lead to more court cases, that will lead to longer... But Nicky, Nicky, that simply, <laughs> simply is not borne out by the case. The fact is, the court system at this moment in time is in utter meltdown. They're cutting legal aid. So that's going to affect fathers. We have children, 200 kids a day, who lose contact with their parents. We have an unelected, unaccountable, unsackable judiciary operating in a kind of secrecy that would make regimes in Iran or North Korea blush. Steady. This is, this is, <laughs> yeah. well, Nikki, can Nikki go in and have a look. Yeah. I'm, I'm, no. I, I'm telling you, it is a catastrophe. It's a disgrace that our children are put into this system, that families are put into the system. Courts are there for criminals, Nikki. They're not there for parents. It's completely the wrong environment. But it's but a minority that end up in the courts rubbish, anyway, isn't it? Absolutely isn't it? rubbish. The, the figure that David Norgrove quotes is 10%. Uh, figure is a complete myth. It was taken from a tiny sample uh, done about five years ago from uh, a government department. You know and I know that one in three children in this country is growing up without a father. You know and well, I know no people who have got access difficulties seeing their children. This is not some kind of minority problem. We're talking about tens of thousands of children going into a secretive well, and abusive system. Karen, from, from what we're getting on our calls and texts, I've got to say it's one hand clapping here. And so, you know, it, the likelihood is this kite is being flown and it will very quickly be pulled down and changed because we hear, I'm reading here that Ian Duncan Smith's not happy with this. Other people in the cabinet are not happy with this. And yes. uh, this, this Prime Minister is going to put his finger up to the wind and see which way it's blowing, isn't he, on this? I if, hope he does. I hope if, he... If, if the reaction we're getting is, is representative... Absolutely. I hope he recognises that the message that he gave to fathers on Father's Day this year yeah, yeah. was actually a very big mistake. I think that... Wait, wait, remind us. Uh, he, he basically said that um, fathers who were separated should be treated as drink drivers, that it should not be acceptable. And the message that he was giving there was based upon an absolute stereotype, a stereotype that has been banded about this country for the past 30, 40 years, that fathers who are separated are always the parents who cause the breakup or are always the parents who run away. If you work with family separation day in, day out, as I do, and I have done over the past 25 years, you recognize that mothers as well as fathers end relationships. Mothers as well as fathers well, what, what, what behave very, were his very badly. What were his exact words? In terms of uh, his message? Yeah. He said that, that um, absent fathers should be treated as drink drivers, that runaway dads should mm. be stigmatised. Well, that's not quite the same as what you said, which was separated dads. No. So let's, let, I mean, well, hang on, Nicky, yeah. there is an important point here, mm. and, I, I, and I can speak for... Um, I, I actually spent eight days uh, on a fast. Some people say it was a much-needed diet, uh, but I spent eight <laughs> days outside David Cameron's house in the middle of summer after he made those reports because what he's doing and what he did in his comments about Father's Day was actually to say quite appalling things. It's, it's, it's incomprehensible that a Mother's Day he would describe single mothers denying fathers access to their children as... But he said absent, w willfully, he's he was talking, was he not, that about no. willfully absent fathers. I've got the quote here, let's see what he said, okay. It's high time runaway dads. You're not a runaway dad, are but you? Hannah, but let me Ted, just address... you're not a runaway. Let me read the rest of the quote. We're stigmatised and the full force of shame was heaped upon them. They should be looked at like drink drivers, people who are beyond the pale. They need and a message around home to them that every part of our, from every part of our culture that what they're doing is wrong. That leaving single mothers who do a heroic job against all the odds to fend for themselves simply isn't acceptable. And, and he's therein not is the problem, well, Nicky. He's not talking he about... He's talking about stereotypes. He's saying all single mothers are heroic and all dads who are separated okay. or leave are runaway dads and it is just not true and it's time we moved away from dividing parents at the point of separation into these two very stark roles because okay. the truth of separation is it's extraordinary com extraordinarily complex it's extraordinarily painful not only for the parents but for the children themselves children often find themselves whisked away from one parent mostly the father and from that point on, their relationship with their father becomes more and more fragile. All right. And Nikki, Matt, st Matt, stay there. We've got to take the travel news. I'll come, I'll come okay. right back to you. Thanks very much. Excellent uh, points from Ruth and Ted and Chris. But all the points coming one way. I feel, my, I feel myself having to put the, the other side of it this morning slightly because no one else seems to be doing it. But if you want to redress what you think is an imbalance, we're, we, we really do honestly try and reflect what we receive in terms of texts 
and phone calls. And that's what we're doing thus far. 0500 909 693. And Joy's in Derbyshire. Hello, Joy. Hello. Good morning. Marilyn is in Stowe. Good morning, Marilyn. Robertson Good morning. Coventry. I'm in Leeds, actually. Oh, I do beg your pardon. Adrian's in Whitney. Marilyn, on you go. Lead oh, uh, I s a family lawyer I've got on my screen. Yep, Ex family excellent. Lawyer. Excellent. Um, what do you think about this report? I think it lacks flair and it lacks vision. I, I, I agree with all the admin changes that they're proposing. I agree that the system is creaking. But I would have looked at the operation of the Children Act, which has been in force now for 20-odd years, yeah. and looked at the deficiencies. And I think that the main problem I have it, with it is the lack of acknowledgement of the needs of other people in family breakdown, quite apart from the children, particularly parents, parents who aren't living with the children, and also grandparents. And I think that's a great shame. Mm -hmm. Joy? Yes. Hi. Jo join us. <laughs> I'm, um, I got divorced 12 years ago, and me and my ex-husband decided it was better for my three sons to live with him rather than me, because we felt that my sons needed a male input into their lives. They were 11, 9 and 7 at the time. That's interesting. Yeah. So um, if, if they would come in with me, it was my decision to leave, although it, the breakdown was not necessarily my fault. The atmosphere was untenable. Mm -hmm. um, I would have had to give up work, go into social housing, live on benefits, because I didn't want my children to become lapsed key kids. That's, and that's an old-fashioned term, but that's what I didn't want. We know exactly what you mean by it, though, yes. Yeah, with my father-in-law, lived, lived with us. So um, there was somebody going to be at home for them when they came home from school. Why should my children have had to give up their family home, their friends, their school, just because we, me and their father didn't get on anymore? It didn't seem fair to and them. How, how has it... How has it panned out over the years? It has turned out very well. My, my three boys are now, two of them at university and one's a teacher. They are very well adjusted. They're in relationships. They haven't spoilt their view of relationships at all. We're both remarried. Stepmom and stepdad get on very well with the children. And it's worked out very well indeed. Marilyn, if only it were more civilised, uh, well, more I, often more ci as civilised as that. I think that most cases uh, remember, uh, private disputes between parents over children do resolve out of court. Most of them, the vast majority of them do. But it's when they get to court, and it's these intractable, prolonged disputes that, that obviously you hear about, you've got to think, what are the principles that govern it? And um, we are so heavily centred on children, and of course the welfare of the child is paramount, and I absolutely agree. But what about the needs of both parents? And I don't think that our law sufficiently looks at that. Matt. I have to agree with Marilyn, because my current oh. husband... That's current husband, that sounds a bit... <laughs> <laughs> the current... <laughs> that's a Terry Wogan um, used to say. He said the current, the current <laughs> Mrs Wogan, didn't he? That's say. right. Um, he has a teenage daughter from a previous relationship oh. who he has no input in whatsoever. We've been to solicitors and we've been told it's, he has no input. It's her, it's her decision all the time. Fathers don't have any rights to see their children, it's children's rights to see their parents. But if that other, the other parent is influencing that child, what can you do? You, Matt, you must have come across many situations far less civilised than the one we're hearing about there from Joy. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, the family justice system is predicated on conflict. And what we've been trying to do, Nikki, is fight for the peace. We think courts, they're for criminals, they're not there for parents, they're the wrong environment. And what, you, what happens, with no disrespect to uh, Marilyn, is that when the solicitors get involved, you know, they are predicated on conflict. You go into a system that because there are no fundamental rights for parents in this country to see their children, you have to prove to the court prove to CAFCAS, which is the Court Welfare Service, that it's in your child's interest for them to see you. So you can be living at home, Nikki, one week with your children, sitting there watching Doctor Who. The next week, if your relationship with your partner or your wife breaks down, you find yourself in this kind of quite Kafka-esque, surreal world of secret family courts where you can't speak to anybody about your case, and you have no rights to see your children and you're effectively cut off and you might be cut off for six months you might be cut off for a year you might be cut off for 20 years you the children grow up without a father and the impact to that and i keep saying about this it is catastrophic for our country i see my children nikki i have three boys i do not 
warn them to live in a country where they have no rights in law for them to see their children or their grandchildren. I think it's incredibly to the detriment and welfare of our society, and that's why I find the support utterly unacceptable because I think the current system, we're still talking about the current system as if somehow it's wonderful, it's working. It is abusive, it is secretive, it is damaging our children and I want people to wake up about this. I want people to say this is wrong, we cannot live in a country like this. Robert, let's get a call from Robert then we'll get the weather and the news and the sport and we'll regroup. Robert, we'll call you Robert, you come from Coventry, we'll call it Coventry. What do you want to say? Morning Nicky. Um, morning Matt. Morning. I was uh, booking a Palace demo with you the other week. Keep up the good work, <laughs> well, mate. Thank you, sir. Um, first of all, along the, a lot of it's already been said, and uh, it's very, very, um, very nice to hear a solicitor talking in the words she was talking. Very refreshing, I have to say. Um, David Norgrove initially initially makes the point that he's legislating for the minority, and this is always his sort of get-out clause, uh, and that most couples can sort out problems for themselves. Well, this is great for the ones who can. I'm very happy for them that they can both be mature enough to do what is obviously in the best interest of the child. However, just as legislation is required for a minor minority of people who commit crime, so it is required for the minority of separating couples who can't come to an agreement. Now, this was David Norgrove's job to sort this out as part of this report. I've been attending family court myself for four years now. Years now. Every now and again, the court hands me a document entitled What the Family Court Expects from Parents. I read it, completely agree with it. It talks about co-parenting, reducing conflict, etc. But the reality is that on the cold face of it, when you actually get into that environment, you find yourself polarised by solicitors, by organisations like CAFCAS, as Matt says, and the situation just goes rapidly downhill to a point where you cannot get out of it. Marilyn, Mar Marilyn, then, is this come back here for a comment on this? We, yeah, well, I think, I think that's because, in law, everybody is focusing on the welfare of the child. But it's confrontational. And everybody is forgetting what the needs of the parents are. And parents have needs. And, incidentally, grandparents have needs. Mm -hmm. And it's all very well producing... I think everyone's well entwined. Pardon? I think everybody's needs are entwined and they don't... Yeah, they don't and, and I don't that. think yeah. sufficient recognition is paid to the needs of the people who are also caught up in family breakdown, namely parents and grandparents. And if you gave integrity to those people, then at least you've equalised the playing field and you've got a chance of making progress. But if you've got a very heavily child-centred review body producing a report headed by an accountant, yes, they've made management recommendations and uh, fair enough, but what do you expect? Okay, okay listen, 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 I, that, there is that, that, right, that, that particular point. No, no, I'm, I'm, Joy, was it, yeah? Yes. Was it, oh, qu quickly then, Joy, sorry. I just think society doesn't help. Because I was an absent mum in a lot of people's eyes, I got stigmatised, even though, you know, I was still seeing my children on a regular basis. The fact they didn't live with me, I was made out to be the wicked witch of the West even though it was a mutual and amicable agreement, everyone assumes that when a relationship breaks down, the child goes with the mother. That, yes, well, that, that, that assumption is part of this, isn't it? Uh, those, uh, those the default positions which we come to. Listen, thank you very much, Joy and Marilyn. Wendy and Smedic. Wendy, what do you want to say this morning? Do dads need more rights? Yeah, I'm disappointed that they didn't change the law to, to give men equal rights to women. And I think it's because the law doesn't trust men to be responsible carers. Mm -hmm. uh, we've uh, undergone a lot of cultural changes over the past 30 years. I remember in the 60s when a lady, you know, had a child on her own, it would be taken away from her. And now we've got a complete about face. Now women can get the benefits, they can earn their own money. They don't really need money in the picture anymore. And we don't judge them morally anymore. So, and I think because of me uh, women carried babies and they fed them, they're seen as having more emotional rights and more physical rights over that child. So. Um, it, it's just too easy to say, yeah, men are not as caring as women. I think it was a lazy political decision not to change the law because it's going to involve a lot of trial and error to get it right. And if they make errors, they're going to expose themselves to a lot of criticism in the press. But really, you can't make an omelette without breaking it. And, you know, it's a, sure that it's a shame they can't trust men. Mm. David Emerson, family lawyer and, and mediator. David, what do you think? Good morning. Good morning. Um, well, I think the vast majority of couples that separate tend to work these things out for themselves. If they can't work them out for themselves, they tend to go and see a mediator or a resolution lawyer. And the vast majority of times, things are negotiated very effectively. 
And the ones that are negotiated effectively often tend to involve a significant amount of shared caring. Well, this is what David Norgrove is saying. Well, he, well he's right. And I think, uh, as my understanding is, is that it was a very fine balance in deciding uh, in the report not to go with this because of the research that they found in Australia where, where forcing shared care didn't actually produce the best results for the children. And the, the fundamental principle in uh, English and Welsh law is, is it's the welfare of the child that's the, that's the main consideration, it's the child's rights that are most important, and it's not really a question of the mother's rights or the father's rights. It's, it's almost more than that, though, isn't it? I mean, it's more than just the statutory. It's, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's, there seems to be a lack of an acknowledgement that there are equal roles. That's the obvious inference that people are taking from this, and that's the headline this morning. And it's very, these are very bad political headlines. Uh, well, they are, but it's, it's a relatively small part of the report, it has to be said. And, and in well. many ways, and in many ways, that the, the father's rights are being more drastically affected by other things that the government are doing at the moment, like, for example, taking away legal aid to enable fathers to take disputes to court where they can't get the rights to see their children, where they can't get the right to make a residence application. That is where the real injustice towards fathers is, n not in the recommendation that's coming out of this report. And Chris in West Sussex is right on that particular point, uh, David Emerson, because you're going through it at the moment. And you, Can you afford it? Uh, legal aid is a problem for you, isn't it? Uh, absolutely, Nicky. Yes, good morning to you all. Morning. Um, morning. Uh, my, my situation is, is uh, I think, a, what I would regard as a, a very difficult and a deeply unpleasant one. Um, I, I separated uh, from my wife uh, at the, towards the end of January. Uh, the morning of the day of this separation, I'd made breakfast for my children. We were sitting around very happily, uh, enjoying breakfast. Um, I had an argument with my wife the next day, uh, that, that evening. The next day, I had to leave early to go to an exhibition for a few days. While I was away, she phoned me saying um, not to come back until the, week, uh, until the weekend, uh, to stay away for a few days. Um, and when I went back on the weekend, she said she wanted a divorce. Since then, um, I've been trying to reconcile with her. That didn't work. Eventually, in April, I decided I had to try and establish contact with my children, and the only way I could do that was by making uh, an application for contact. I employed a solicitor. I started paying for that solicitor. When I realized that my wife had become so entrenched in refusing me to uh, see my children, um, it was costing me more and more money, and I had to decide, well, no, that's it. I can't afford it any longer. I've got to, uh, I've got to do this on my own. How old were they, are the children? Nine and four. I have a daughter of nine and a son of four, uh, Nikki. Um, so they're, they're, they're both quite, quite young. We've had a CAF um, CAS report, which has now been... Uh, submitted. Um, I'm actually going to the hearing on the 14th of November, but the system is such that um, it does favour the mother um, from the point of view that um, if she makes allegations that are uh, that you as the father would say those are false, they're completely untrue, there is a duty on the part of the family courts that they must investigate anyway those allegations, irrespective of whether they are true or not. That delays the whole process, thereby giving the mother more time to um, in further uh, become entrenched in her position. And it also actually means that uh, there's less, that there's, uh, there's a longer period of time that the children do not have access to their father. David Emerson, uh, uh, yeah, David Emerson, listening to those, those points there, <coughs> is the system biased against men? Um, well, listening to that case, you, you would certainly think so. I think the great difficulty is going back to this idea that, that, that it's, the, it's the children that need to be protected first. And once, once serious allegations are made against a child, these do have to be investigated. Against a child? Uh, yeah. Or, 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 okay. or, or, or against the, 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 against the, the father, the, the, I think he means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, the, the, these have to be investigated. The only way you can do that is, is test them by giving evidence in the court and a judge making a decision. And, you know, the delay that this causes is absolutely you know, unacceptable. Nicky, can I, can I interject, just to interject as Matt from Fathers to Justice, the, the, the problem is, Nicky, is the system incentivises the use of false allegations. To qualify for legal aid, 
all mother needs all mother needs to do is to tick the fact has there been any abuse and that can be financial abuse emotional abuse such as shouting uh, physical abuse and that incentivizes people to make false allegations and what it's like it's almost like a salem like witch hunt but instead of ducking witches into rivers and seeing if they drown if they drown they're innocent and if they live they're guilty it's the same with fathers every obstacle is put in front of you we're talking about david cameron talking about deadbeat fathers and runaway dads should be treated like drink drivers what about the tens of thousands of good loving fathers first-rate fathers treat like second-class parents in in this country and the court system by putting these obstacles in front of us makes it incredibly difficult for fathers to get to see their children and and to say there's no bias in the system is incredible how can you say there's no bias David, with 97 percent david emerson of, of of with 97 97 percent of residencies go to mothers david emerson um, well, I think the vast majority of residences go, go, go to mothers uh, simply because, in, in practical terms, that, that's the way it's always been in terms of the day-to-day -day arrangement but within that family. But that's wrong, surely. Um, well, in the vast majority of cases, fathers would make it as good a parent as, as the mothers. Um, that's ab absolutely true. Uh, 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 Nicky, sorry, it's Chris here again. Chris, yeah. uh, my, my relationship with my wife uh, prior to the separation was one where... I would cook, I would do breakfast at the weekends. In fact, when we had the argument, I, w I was ironing some clothes for, for, my, for my daughter for school for the week. I had a very involved relationship with my children. However, the system is such, um, as the gentleman from Fathers of, uh, for Justice has just said, sorry, I didn't uh, catch, catch his name. Matt. Um, Matt, sorry, Matt. That's right. um, as, as he quite rightly said, all the mother has to do is tick a box saying either emotional violence, psychological violence, um, physical violence, whatever it might be, in order to get the legal aid. So immediately the father is, uh, can only rely on his own funds to, to actually pay either for, um, uh, for a solicitor, which many fathers cannot afford to do, and then what ultimately happens, as in my case, um, I'm acting as a litigant in person. Yeah. I'm having to speak for myself yeah. in court. Listen, now, thank this, this, this is fundamentally wrong. F OK, it's 9.51. Thank you so much. Warren in Swindon, thanks for hanging on, everybody, because uh, we've had some quite detailed points this morning and quite a lot of people have been hanging on the line. But, Warren, what was your experience of, of uh, the court system? Good morning, Nicky. Um, very tough. Um, God, I think I'm going to start crying even just even considering what I've been through in the last two years. Um, well, I have my daughter every weekend since the relationship with her mother broke down. Um, she stopped contact for no reason the week of my daughter's fifth birthday and the same week my son was born after, we, uh, after I moved on with somebody else. Um, it's taken me 18 months to even get to see my daughter again, and I had to, because of my barrister advised me, was to go to a contact centre. Um, the court took no consideration in regards to what contact was previously in place. I had my daughter every single weekend for over two years. Not only that, I even collected my ex-partner's other daughter from school every Wednesday and had her at my house for dinner and then dropped her back home. So I had my daughter like three times a week, all weekend, courts have not been interested in that whatsoever they um do not they're not interested in hearing anything what the father's done in the past all they're interested in is the mother my solicitor asked uh my daughter's mother why it broke down she said we fell out since then she's been to court and made accusations about me and the court are not interested in listening to anything else apart from the mother's point of view what, what she said what accusations Sorry, what accusations has she made? How damaging, how upsetting? Um, one, uh, about drug abuse, and I was told I would have to take a drug test. I said, that's fine, I'm willing to take a drug test. She was ordered by the courts to pay for that. She failed to pay for it. And then the last time I went to court, she turned around and said um, I was abusive towards her. Even though the courts were given police disclosure from both of us. There was only one case of any physical violence, and that was by her on me. But the courts have completely dismissed that. David Emerson, is it all too easy to make such accusations in this situation? It is easy to make accusations, but I think 
the difficult, and I, and I say this very, very carefully indeed, that the, the, the courts have a difficult problem in trying to understand what is a genuine problem that, that needs to be investigated and tested, because, of course, you've had phone-ins in the past all around the Baby P case where, you know, accusations were made there, they weren't properly investigated, and, of course, that ended in absolute tragedy. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that any of the callers here necessarily fall into that category, but how do the courts know without this being tested? One, one of, the, one of the, the best ways forward is, is, is to try and get a dialogue going, which is why there's a lot of emphasis in the Norgrove report about trying mediation. That's actually wrong, David. Mediation what you just said work, about though. Baby P is actually wrong. Actually, the natural biological father was denied access to his son Peter because of false allegations. So there's a father who wants to be a loving, caring, responsible dad, look after his child, who had his son murdered at the hands of mum and her boyfriends. So that's actually wrong. That's a good example of a case where a father was denied access on the basis of no evidence whatsoever. And I think it's important, not just about dads who've had false allegations, what about the fathers we know, the high-profile fathers we know who've had contact problems? Look at David Blunkett, the former Home Secretary. You know, he had contact issues. What about Sir Bob Geldof? He went to the family courts. He had contact issues. What about Alec Baldwin, the American actor? He has contact issues. These are not people who are abusive or dangerous. These are good, loving parents All right, John who are struggling and jo to see their children. John in Leicestershire, have you had contact issues? Oh, I've gone through hell, yeah. I mean, I'll try to be brief. The point I want to make is when I heard David, or the gentleman in your studio, defending the status quo, what he's just done is he's condemned thousands more fathers like me to go through the hell yeah. that I've gone through. And I know from my own hellish experiences that what it is is about making money for solicitors. The mm. whole situation is so adversarial. My solicitor was fantastic. My ex-wife's solicitor, her first two solicitors, were awful. It was all about making money. And all this nonsense about this is the, the, the best option. He said that if they were to have an assumption of shared residency or shared equal rights for parents, then it would put the child in the middle of a dispute. My child was in the middle of our dispute because of the law as it stands. I've known two men, at least two people, kill themselves because of this. The hell that they've gone through. They weren't able to cope with it. And that wasn't, wasn't because of the weak. It's because people simply don't understand how awful it is. And one more point I'd say is my ex-wife didn't enjoy this. I've, I've gone through everything that ever be said. I've been accused of being a drug, drug taker, a paedophile, beating my child. I now have a good what, relationship. by her? Oh, yeah, well, but it wasn't her, it's a system. She, well, how can a system almost, accuse you of being a paedophile? Well, no, no, what I mean is it's almost like they have a rule book for mothers. You know, she, my, my ex-partner is, is a lovely person. She's friendly, compliant. She's a normal, middle-class, decent person. Where do they go away and learn about, oh, say he's a drug dealer? It's all the same well, here in the States. Well, where where the paedophile Where's the law to... Where's you the know, law to you know, if you're a normal, nice person, you don't accuse another human being of being a paedophile. Oh, you well, do, Nicky, you do. I'm, I'm sorry, that I'm, is... I'm sorry, Nicky, this is the point. People don't understand. Right. People don't understand. People say, well, this can't happen. It happens. Well, how, can that, so how, can that, how can that? How can that? How can that? How can any... The point is, Nicky, can I just address this... It happened this, to me. Can I just address well, this I, point here? I believe here? you. I, I'm... Maybe... There's a point here in civil courts. The civil courts investigate these allegations on the balance of probability. Yeah. What the law oh. should do, the law should treat... If there's an allegation that child's well, at risk... OK, what does she say about the... The police should be called. The police should be involved. John, what does she say? You say you've got a reasonable relationship with now. She's a nice woman, fundamentally. What does she say about having made that Accusation now? Well, I don't know because I'm not allowed to speak to her, her ex husband, her present husband, and we, all we do is we text each other. And, and that's why I've given a false name. I certainly don't want to rock the boat because I enjoy a good relationship. I know, she, she once said to my, my, my father, I don't want to live on a peaceful life, but it's almost like they, people get pressured into it because they can. How do we start it out? We, we, both, we both love our daughter completely. We're both good parents. She's an excellent mother. How do we both start it out? With the presumption of shared parenting, this would never have, have happened. Okay. And, and, and the North Wales report said that it should encourage mediation. Mediation can't take place because once she says no, that's it. If we're there to be shared parenting, she would have to mediate. Thank you so, much, so very much, Oliver. We are out of time, no doubt, a subject to which we will return. This is Five Live. <laughs>